The verdict is in on Virtual Blockchain Week 2020. According to speakers, VIPs, and attendees, the week-long event was a huge win for the crypto world. Lots of meaty content came out from the event as we had the opportunity to speak with Tim Draper, Roger Ver, CZ, Justin Sun, and John McAfee in fireside chat fashion. The women of blockchain crushed it with original presentations from Brittany Kaiser, Caitlin Long, and Elise Sam. And Don Tapscott closed out the event with an epic blockchain State of the Union address that everyone should see. As for us, well, everyone at Bad Cryptopia HQ is both exhausted and elated. And today we're here to recap the week and share the best nuggets as reported on by our friends at Cointelegraph. This is the We're Tired and Excited and Hungry But Here, episode number 402 of the Bad Crypto Podcast. And greetings, friends, and soon-to-be friends from all around the world. This is the Bad Crypto Podcast. I'm Joel Calm. I'm Travis Wright, and welcome to week two of Virtual Blockchain Week. The content we have this week for you is even more amazing. Wait, who who would we get that we didn't already have? Oh, we're going to have some repeats? I mean, and, uh, what a week, Travis. I mean, it was truly a sprint-a-thon. You know, they say, well, some things are a sprint, some things are a marathon. This was a sprint-a-thon. It was both run fast and hard and go for a long time. I mean... Kind of a blur. It's kind of a yeah. blur. Like, there was so much content. It's like, you know... I've personally never been part of putting on an event. I know you have, right? And I know that Aaron, our producer, has put on a few events. I have not. So it's like I've never experienced the stress. So to me, seeming like putting on an event, oh, yeah, that seems like it should be great, easy. It shouldn't be too hard. Oh, and do it in 30 days from idea to launch. Oh, yeah, no problem. Like, wow, there's so many things that we learned as a result of this thing. And I'm so pleased at how well it turned out in the comments. And the praise that some of the folks who are part of this thing, who are tuned in, like they they seem pretty happy with it. Yeah, and and I am too. Uh, but we're also happy that the show has sponsors, and want to give them a shout out before we jump into the episode. World Markets is a new sponsor to the show. They're an award winning firm that increases your ROI with managed trading services powered by AI. They were founded in two thousand three as a precious metal dealer, and the company has gained a reputation as a leader in gold and silver investments. They've expanded to provide digital trading services for other markets such as cryptocurrencies. STOs and Forex. What you've got here is an all-in-one platform that allows trading in multiple markets, managed trading services, an award-winning firm, investment plans for both small and big investors, and AI technology that consistently outperforms human traders. Go check them out. Worldmarkets.com is the website, www.worldmarkets.com. Also want to thank our sponsor, Upland. Upland is a location-based property trading game paired with a decentralized economy. We've talked about it before. It's really awesome. People love it. People who are in the game, they start to become addicted to it because it's really fun. Players can buy, sell, trade, develop virtual properties that are based on real-world addresses. And blockchain technology ensures true ownership for the players. And Uplanders, that's people who have earned at least 10,000 Upix, I believe, uh, collect in-game currency called Upix as the reward for their ownership and completing missions within the game. There are collections, treasure hunts, some other really cool Easter egg sort of things that's going on that have gone on, a lot of different things. And Upix can be used to purchase more properties, to develop land, to pay for digital goods and services that other Uplanders will create and provide. You're actually going to be able to have your own business with inside the virtual world which is going to be an interesting thing. The objective is to establish an open economy where various various stakeholders can interact and transact with one another without intermediaries. You can check them out at badco.in forward slash upland. All right. Well, let's take a look at CoinGecko and timestamp this for it is May the 3rd. 
and it is 12.20 p.m. Mountain Standard Time. The crypto market caps very much in the green. $250 billion Bitcoin hitting almost 9400 I believe, this last week. Currently at 88.36. Ethereum, 208. XRP, just shy of $0.22. Cents. A tether is a dollar even. Bitcoin Cash, $250. Bitcoin SV, 206 Litecoin, 47 and a half. EOS, 282 Binance Coin, 17 bucks, And Tezos wrapping out the top 10 at $2.71. Yeah, let's look at the big winners for the week. The biggest winner for the week, Hyperion, which I have no idea what that is, but it sounds important. All the hype. Streamer Datacoin, D-A-T-A, that was up 57%. Sia Coin up almost 40%. Theta Network, which was one of our streaming partners. Now, I'm not going to try to say that that... that uh, virtual blockchain week being streamed on that made it pop like that, but it went up thirty, almost thirty two percent this week. And uh, you're not going to say it didn't, though. But I'm not going to say it didn't. And they streamed us on the on the very front of their page, and we had so much activity and comments and stuff going on over there. That was awesome. Not only that, I, I wanted to give them a special shout out. There's actually two blockchain based. Uh, video sites that featured us. Theta was one and DLive was the other. DLive was very helpful. Of course, that is Tron owned DLive. And we talk a little bit about that in our interview with Justin Sun. But the guys at Theta.tv were the most accommodating, the kindest, the most helpful. I'm not saying DLive wasn't kind or helpful. I'm just saying Theta bent over backwards to make sure that our experience with them and your experience to watch on their platform was triple a really really excited about that and i want to take a closer look at what they're doing and i think travis we might have to do more streaming over there on theta i think so i mean it seems to me that we got a uh, we got a master's class in streaming video this week so <laughs> Might as well i got, the, I got the phd yeah yeah, you got the PhD over there. That's true. I was doing all the streaming to all the places. It was uh, it was amazing. And uh, really, for the week, no massive big losers. You know, Hive had a really nice run up, down 29% this last week. Mm -hmm. uh, the Nervous Network, they got nervous and mm -hmm. lost 12% this week. But for the most part, uh, no real major hits on the downside. And there's a story here on Cointelegraph, Travis, that makes it look like we might be in for a run. Of course, you know, there's always these articles. These indicators point to this unprecedented thing, but these indicators say here's the potential downside. So, yeah. you know, it is what it is. Well, let's see. Yeah, and this actually is the Editor's Choice uh, article right now on Cointelegraph.com. Bitcoin has not done this since 2015 before its 10,000% bull run. Now, what did it do? It had a huge 20% surge in value in one day, right? Is that what it was? Yep. That, Pretty that's much. It. I mean, the halving is just, what, nine, eight, nine days away? I need to pull up the Bitcoin clock here, but I guess this is something that happened then and uh, happened again now, and who knows what's going to happen next. Yeah, it looks like the Bitcoin clock having is in eight days, four hours, and 12 minutes. So this is timestamp. This is Sunday, May uh, 3rd at about 1.30 p.m. Central Time. So by the time that we do, we're going to record next Friday, I believe, for the bad news episode. So that'll just be a couple days away. So next, next bad news, you're going to want to tune in. And then the following bad news, because there's all kinds of crazy stuff that's going to be going on over this next week. We might do a special day of having, right? Maybe, maybe we actually record while the having is having, and mm. we can track it. Maybe we'll live stream that trap. We could call it the having happening. Yeah, let's. I, I, in fact, let's do that. Let's just live stream the having as it happenings. Mm, maybe we could have some guests on with us and have a little powwows. It'd be kind of fun as people little. talk about it in real time little powwows well you know coin telegraph was the lead media partner on this uh, conference and after many of the keynotes the speakers left the room and they went to another room where they met with the coin telegraph journalist and they did an interview so the journalists were watching the talks and then they had questions to them after it. And so what we want to do for this episode is do recaps of the key things 
that some of the speakers said. And, and by the way, we had over 30 speakers, more than I think a half a dozen or so sponsor speakers. And we're thankful to all of the speakers. You all came, you all brought it, and we're grateful for your participation, whatever it was. Um, and there's, you know, the video lives on of what you said. You know, it's out there now forever in the internet. But we're going to cover some of the highlights with you here. Yeah, and that was one of the things. I mean, there were so, so many amazing speakers. And I think what's one thing that's really cool about a virtual conference is uh, at a virtual conference, you actually sit and watch through all the sessions for the most part, if you like. You tune in and you actually get to see the content. A lot of times at events, you're walking around, you're networking, and you're, you're, you're chatting. That's an amazing part of the conference. But a lot of times, like I remember we went to Consensus last year. I don't think I saw one session last year. So I didn't gain any knowledge from go. I made some great connections, but I, I didn't see any sessions because we were so busy walking around. This was great because people got to actually see the sessions. And we found ways to build networking into the event to have the best of both worlds. So I think that part was really cool. I saw a picture of Jeff's sessions. Does that count? Doesn't count. Doesn't count. By the way, you talked about the networking that takes place at the real events. We did the best we could to simulate networking at the virtual event, and we did it by having three parties for the VIPs, those who purchased the VIP ticket very inexpensively. It was $97, and we donated half of that to um, Binance Charities. And when we're done recording, I'm going to go ahead and make the donation from Bad Crypto to that charity. And we encourage you to go also to Binance.Charity and help out there. I think the total amount was something like $3,200 that we're donating. Uh, which came from the purchase of the VIP tickets. Anyway, you know, why don't we talk a little bit about what we did for these, you know, to facilitate this networking and how it turned out. Yeah. So one of the cool things that Zoom has, if you if you have the right um, the right membership on Zoom, allows you to have these breakout rooms. And Joel had discovered that sort of early on, and we said, "Wow, wow, well, if we have these breakout rooms, you know, we could, you know, have a main room and then send everybody to." a side room and then they can communicate and interact and then bring them back to the main room and then randomize them all again and send them off to another room. So what was so cool about this was that, you know, I don't know, four or five different times during the networking times, we would go and we're, we're sitting in a room with all kinds of new people, people we've, some people we've met before, some speakers, some influencers, some sponsors, some of the VIP folks. And it was just a great opportunity to meet new people. And some people had actually said, this version of networking was more powerful for them because they're kind of an introvert. They like to sit at the bar and drink beer and not talk to people. And this right here, sort of the, the, the method and the format sort of forced people out of their comfort zone a little bit to communicate and to introduce themselves. And so many people ended up making way more connections than they would at a normal event just because maybe they're a little shy. Allow me to introduce myself. I'm a man who mines Bitcoin. Woo, too, woo. You're too shy, shy. Uh -huh, uh -huh. <laughs> Can you name that band? No. Nope. Too shy in the no, nope. no clue. One hit wonder. You, uh, they were called Kaja Gugu. Kaja Gugu. Yeah, that was I remember that name. I would have never yeah. remembered that though. You know who's not too shy, Mr. Travis Wright, is Ching Peng Zhao. CZ, the founder of Binance, and it was great to have a one-on-one -on -one with him you know, during this and, and uh, pick his brain on where crypto is going. Because, man, their exchange is, boom, world's biggest crypto exchange. Yeah. And not only that, in the, uh, you know, Cointelegraph a couple months ago, they put out their top 100 most influential people in crypto. And CZ's number one. Yeah. The most, the most influential person in crypto in 2020 is CZ. And he came on our show. Yeah, he was uh, one of the keynote speakers here at Virtual Blockchain Week, and he was talking about the free market to Cointelegraph because their concerns from the crypto community regarding the size and the influence of Binance as they make these acquisitions. You know, we asked him about coin market cap in that acquisition, and CZ said, "So there's the worry about." Are we too big or not? And then there is, why are users choosing us? If we abuse the power that we have and then abuse our influence, then people would not 
choose us. I don't know if that's necessarily true, Travis, because I feel like Facebook abuses their influence all the time, but we still go there because it's where everybody is. Well, I would also say is that not everybody is aware to the fact that Facebook is doing nefarious things. And and plus the, the whole dopamine hit and people are addicted to Facebook and you're right, their friends are there. I, I still go to Facebook, even though I don't go nearly as much as I used to. It is. So they are quite, they are quite big. And, but he says this, the reason they're growing is not because we're abusing the power. Uh, there's like a thousands of other exchanges and the competition is very fierce. Here's one of the things that I like. He goes, he says this, he goes, you know, Binance is tiny compared to tech giants. You know, I, and I, he also went on to talk about how, you know, users like to use the different platforms that are providing them the most value. And, you know, I remember like that was one of the reasons why I started using Google so much. It was like, oh, look, the Google search is amazing. Oh, well, look. Oh, they have Gmail now. This is great. I can have my email here and my search here. Oh, look. And they just kept adding new features and adding new things that made the platform more valuable. Oh, they just bought YouTube. Wow, this is great. Well, you know, that would be great if they weren't sort of using their power and eliminating certain pieces of content and opinions they don't like. That's very bad. So when a tech, a tech giant becomes too big for their britches, which I think a lot of them have, that's a that's a big fancy term. My, my, my grandma used to say, you're getting too big for your britches. And uh, so some of those tech giants have. I don't know that Binance is getting too big for their britches yet because I've not seen them, uh, you know, overstretch their power uh, yet, uh, you know, and we'll see. Did your grandma ever tell you to go get a switch? Oh, grandma tell me to get a switch. Yeah. 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 So she can hit you in your britch. Yeah. And you, and you think you're smart. You're like, hey, hey I'm going to get this really small one here. So it doesn't hurt. Those are the worst. Ones. But grandma, was. <laughs> she knew. She knew. <laughs> she knew. Go pick your own switch. You're going to go out there and I'm going to beat your ass and you go get it. You like, pick all right. with a tr- get a tree that she can't lift. That's what you should have done, right? Yeah. So you can get bludgeoned to death. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, switch. I, I, I remember going through the going through the, the logic in my head, and I was like, I'm going to get this one right here because it's smaller. But it turns out it goes. <laughs> ah, those are worse. You don't want those. Those lose little welts. So I remember not. You know, we asked uh, CZ if he would have ever dreamt that Binance would get so big so fast. And he said, at the time, our goal was let's try to reach number one in three years. But, you know, sometimes you get lucky. Yeah. That's, that's what happened. I think the funniest part of it was that he that he set up Binance pretty much the same time we set up Bad Crypto. And it's just like the tale of two stories right there. Here he is, super billionaire. And here we are. Still chugging along. (laughs) (laughs) By the way, the replays of all five nights are at virtualblockchainweek.com. Go there and click the watch button. You'll see the full day. It's, you know, five days, about four hours or more each day with all of the speakers. But I have edited down most of the keynote speakers and we're uploading those to the YouTube channel. So if you go to youtube.com forward slash bad crypto, you will find individual uh, talks. Some of them are up now. Like I just uploaded Justin Sun before we um, started recording here today and there's a bunch of others, but they're going to keep popping up. So go subscribe to our YouTube channel. And I've also, I'm trying to connect us to library. So our entire video library is also available decentralized in case YouTube becomes asshole again and decides to take us down. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was great. Thank you for putting my, uh, you put, put up my video pretty quickly. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the funny money presentation that I did and I've sent it around to a few people and uh, there's a lot of things people had never heard of before. So it's amazing when you're thinking about people just, a lot of people don't understand fiat currency. They don't understand what that means, but they don't also understand the whole web of craziness that happens around money and the history of money as it has evolved over time. Mm -hmm. Well, we also, I believe day two, was it that we talked to Roger Ver? It's a big blur, but uh, we spoke with Roger and I, you know, you can't help but just like Roger as a person, you know, regardless of what you think of Bitcoin cash and whatever jokes and barbs we've put out there about, you know, Mm -hmm. conflict there. He's just a nice guy. Yeah, I think it was Thursday. I think you came on on the third. Is the the article is dated for the thirtieth of April? So I think maybe that was Thursday. Right. But but again, the, the whole week seems like a blur. I can I couldn't tell you when most people were doing stuff because we were moving so fast. But this is great. He says in the lockdown, it's a matter of economic freedom. I think he mentioned that 
multiple times during the course of the thing is that he's all about voluntary uh, volunteerism. He's all about, you know, uh, having our own rights to do our own thing, which I'm all about. Mm-hmm. And, and, and he says this, I think the lockdown needs to come to an end right now today. If you want to lock yourself down more power to you, feel free, have at it. But for the rest of us that want to live our lives, we should be able to do that. We're responsible adults, Mr. Joe Com. If I want to go to the beach and I'm aware that this thing's going on, I'm going to stay six feet away from other people. It's almost like they're treating people like we're preschoolers and toddlers and we're not able to make our own decisions and remain safe without some authoritarian you know, person surrounding us and telling us what to do. People coming. I mean, this is so crazy. I just saw a video of the police going to this lady's house and then threatening her because she let her kid go over to another person's house and play. Yeah. And just uh, before we recorded, I saw a video of a guy, I want to say in North Carolina, that defied uh, orders and opened up his tattoo shop and the police came and, and cuffed him and took him away. Mm hmm. I'm Wasn't like the whole thing. It's so crazy. America. It's bizarre. Wasn't it the whole thing like, hey, isolate yourself for 15 days to make sure you don't have it, and then you should be good, right? So, I mean, I've isolated myself for way longer than that, and I don't have it, and I should be able to let my kids go play wherever the hell they want to play. They've been isolated too, right? Well, Roger kind of summed it up in a tweet. He said, if you are worried about the coronavirus, you should self isolate, leave the rest of us alone. And I know that there's issues with, hey, you know, your liberty uh, can impinge on my health, right? If you're not responsible with how you manage that liberty. So I understand both sides of the argument here, uh, but I can under, I see why he's erring towards freedom. You know, it is, it's my right as a grown ass adult American to get sick and die. If you know, I want to do that. Yeah. Well, the thing is the thing to me is like, yeah, I think if you out there, if you have it and you're purposely going out and you're licking door handles and, you know, spreading the disease on purpose, then you need to be dealt with. You need to be, you need to go to, you need to go to jail. And cause that's a horrible thing you're doing. And there's been instances of people who've actually even spreading stuff in places. It's weird, but like, everybody else we just want to go out and enjoy the day plus man it was 27 degrees celsius here in uh in my town yesterday which is almost like what almost 80 degrees i think what are you doing talking at celsius well because i because i know that celsius they said that at at 26 degrees celsius that's when the virus dies it's like it has zero chance and so i've been paying attention to when it was 27 degrees celsius and uh it was or 26 degrees celsius and it was yesterday so very Mm -hmm. hot Well, also hot was Caitlin Long's talk. I mean, she was on fire because she's basically calling the crypto industry to be incredibly transparent, that the transparency is going to end up being a force for good for everybody. She said, we need greater disclosure. Quote, in the crypto sector, there's really very little disclosure about how much indebtedness the various exchanges and custodians have provided. And she said that the crypto community should not recreate the same thing that happened in the traditional financial industry. Accountability. Well, we don't want fractional reserve crypto, right? So I talked about that in the presentation. What fractional reserve banking means is like if I deposit a million dollars into the bank, then that bank will loan that million dollars out nine additional times to create $10 million out of thin air. And then everybody they loan that money to has to pay interest on top of that money that didn't even exist before I deposited that million dollars. And so banks only have to keep in a very small reserve amount of that money. In America, it's 10%. In Canada, it used to be only 5%. And then Canada did away with it. Like, there is no there is no reserve in in Canada at all. It's all like banks don't have to hold it very much money in at all. Uh, it's just very peculiar, and we don't want that in the crypto world. Like if you like if I had put my Bitcoin in in, in an exchange, I might be going to trade it or I'm going to do something. I don't want you to sell my Bitcoin or let or do stuff with my Bitcoin, and then maybe I don't have I can't have it back because if everybody tries to go to the exchange at once and get their crypto, that crypto should be there. This is not fractional reserve banking. Don't turn that into that. Could you imagine if there was quantitative easing in Bitcoin? <laughs> at go burr, Bitcoin go burr. That's it. That's mm-hmm. that's the end of Bitcoin. The fact that there's only 21 million ever is what makes Bitcoin so powerful. And, you know, there was multiple guests that we had at Virtual Blockchain Week that said, it's not that the value of Bitcoin is necessarily going up. It's that the value of the dollar is going down. Mm-hmm. 
That's exactly it. That was that was echoed time and time again. So when you think about the you know the the uh, predictions of Bitcoin hitting two hundred and fifty thousand or Bitcoin hitting a million dollars, the re- that's the reason why. Like the value of the dollar is going to keep decreasing over time, and the amount of Bitcoin is going to stay the same, and the purchasing power of Bitcoin is going to increase and increase and increase over time. And maybe we see that this week and and over the next subsequent couple months as after the happening happens. And Travis, if you'll remember a month or so ago when the markets crashed because of the shutdown, gold fell about 200 and Bitcoin took a huge hit. The whole crypto markets took a huge hit and people were saying, well, I guess gold's not a safe haven. Like, ah, crypto, you're not a safe haven. Well, fast forward just a few weeks to today, gold is worth more today than it was when the markets crashed. By the way, the markets are still down, uh, what, from 30,000 down to like 24, 25,000 on the, the Dow Jones. Um, and Bitcoin is worth more than it was the day the crash happened. Basically, the losses from that emis- initial panic sell have com- been completely regained. And so Caitlin Long referred to this as Bitcoin being a safe haven asset. It's proven that, you know what, maybe it is like gold. Mm -hmm. Maybe it is. And, you know, you would think that whenever the the governments around the world turn their printing presses on, you know, that, that increases the amount of dollars that are out there and that decreases the buying power of those dollars. And so you would expect gold and silver to go up. You would expect uh, Bitcoin to go up, but the markets don't always do that. Like they don't do what you expect them to do sometimes. And it's always been, it's always been wild to sort of watch that. Like I remember 2010, 2011, when I was buying lots of gold and silver and should have been buying Bitcoin, but bought lots of gold and silver. If I had done that, otherwise I, I probably would be on a beach somewhere locked down. Um, but uh, no, you can't it, go to the beach. Sorry. Oh, that's right. You can't go to the beach. That's right. But you could look at it at your window, which would be nice. You could uh, pine for the sand. Yeah, I could pine. But I, that's why I think one of the issues is, is that it doesn't always go the way you think it should go. Sometimes it does. Sometimes it doesn't. But, man, it's wild watching it all, all sort of play out. Yeah. And I want to give a quick shout out here to the lead sponsor that we had for Virtual Blockchain Week. Just want to say Jaws Paradise. Thank you so much for believing in us. He is the founder of CryptomaticATM.com, and he gave away two of these Cryptomatic ATM machines during Virtual Blockchain Week. And he's got a really interesting business opportunity because I think as Bitcoin does prove itself to be a a safe haven for your money, we're going to see more people trying to trade in their worthless dollars at these ATMs. Also, one of the presentations that uh, was at the event was Elise Sam, or as a crazy bone likes to call her, Alize Sam. (laughs) Which is a which is a delicious drink, and in, in Crazy Bone, she actually got Crazy Bone, one of the dudes from Bone Thugs and Harmony, to come to the Friday night after party the VIP thing. It was so crazy. He actually sang all of uh, the top uh, Bone Thugs and Harmony songs, which was pretty cool. We have video of it, but those of you that weren't in the VIP, maybe we'll release it at some point for people to see it. Yeah. Um, so stable coins are the gateway to decentralization. Uh, Sam of uh, Give Nation, she thinks that uh, that they are the gateway, and companies like Facebook and J.P. Morgan uh, are are going to be that going to be that facilitator to help decentralize these assets. And so she said, "Hey, uh, when talking about the or these digital assets having a place in the crypto world for the long haul, she said they don't have to. They don't have that decentralization. They don't feel that freedom uh, that." We all want to experience, but stable coins offer the benefits of a cryptocurrency, including cryptographic security and the ability to transfer assets digitally with speedy transactions. It's just one of those things where stable coins, the value of them stay stable, which is pretty handy whenever we're in a volatile world of the crypto world. Right, Mr. Jokam? Absolutely. And uh, Ali Sam and, and Kusha Zim co-author the 2020 Complete Stablecoin Guide. You can go find that on Amazon. Looks like it's available for Kindle for just $3.99. So uh, nobody's done more research on stablecoins than these two. So we recommend that you go grab a copy of their ebook. And as you're doing that, while you're downloading that, I want to talk about Mati Greenspan uh, because 
he always delivers Travis his newsletter, his quantum economics newsletter. Every one of you should subscribe to it. It is just every day he sends it out. It's very, it's personable, but it's also packed with relevant content and insights. And uh, he brought the goods. He, it was uh, four in the morning, I think, in Israel, which he was in Tel Aviv. And he was watching his child while giving his talk. And like, you know, every now and then he would turn and, and handle like a little snack to his kid. <laughs> yeah. I was a little toddler there. I think maybe less than less than a year and a half old. I don't know exactly how old, but it was really cute. And uh, yeah, father of the year to Monty Greenspan. I mean, also just to get up at that time of the day and to, uh, to to be a part of that was pretty awesome. And he did. He had he had a full on presentation that really went into a lot of deep analysis. And remember, that's where we met Monty for the first time. He was the lead, the senior analyst at eToro, and then he left and went to create quantumeconomics.io. And so he was talking about these different charts, how they correlate with the S&P 500. And there's this perfect correlation that's going on. Talked about unemployment and talked about all these other sort of things that are relevant to, to us today. So if you haven't had a chance to check out his presentation, you want to go online and go check it. He was on Monday. And uh, I think that was a that was a spectacular, spectacular presentation. Su- super bullish on the Bitcoins. It's up for the year. And uh, he's just, you know, he's one of those guys that looks at the data. By the way, speaking of eToro, Mr. Travis Wright, we haven't really made a announcement about this yet, but we have upped the game for eToro. If you are an American citizen and you have not yet opened up an eToro account, we want to give you $50 in free Bitcoin for doing so. So go to badco.in forward slash eToro. All the rules are right there. Super easy to do. We've sent Bitcoin to a lot of you before. This is definitely a limited time offer. So go check it out at badco.in forward slash eToro. You know, Travis, our uh, opening day was so exciting because there's that opening day energy. And what was really thrilling was to have the first keynote uh, fireside chat be delivered by Tim Draper. Yeah, that was awesome. And the it, it became even more awesome because originally he was only supposed to be here with us for like about 30 minutes. Yeah. So this is one of the things that happens whenever you're doing a conference is like, uh-oh, there's a snafu. This person didn't realize they were this day. We need to move them and this. And uh-oh, now we have this huge 20-minute gap. And But this was seamless because this happened while Tim, the person that was supposed to speak after Tim, uh, had to had to postpone. And so, well, seamlessly, we just said, all right, well, let's just keep on going. And so we took his 30 minutes into 50 minutes, and it was just action-packed full of information. And, that, and I think so seamlessly to the audience, they probably didn't even realize how we were panicking in the back end while asking him questions, while trying to figure out what we're going to do until we decided, okay, let's just go ahead and keep it going with Tim. And uh, he had lots of interesting things to say, didn't he? Uh, Yeah, I wasn't panicking. Okay. Yeah, I mean, because I read Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Don't panic. That's true. Number one. Doesn't help. Just roll with the punches. You know, we, we talked about his prediction that he made um, in 2018, he said that Bitcoin would reach a quarter of a million dollars by the end of 2022 or early 2023. He doubled down. He said, that's my prediction, sticking with it. I'm very confident that that is going to happen. That's happening. It's kind of funny. I'm not. What was the context for him saying it's kind of funny? Well, I think he said it's kind of funny and then went in and told another story. But I don't think that they I think they just pulled that quote out with him just saying that. So it was it was interesting. So. You know, think about this. Every time you use your credit cards and you do these different things, like, you know, retailers are going to say, oh, you mean I don't have to pay 2.5 to 4% to the banks every time someone swipes a credit card? That's going to be handy. So as as uh, as people start using crypto more and more, that that's a good process. I mean, you know what? Credit cards really aren't great for retailers. It's handy because people, more people have more buying power. But, you know, retailers' profit margins are so small a lot of times, and whenever the the credit card companies are taking two point five to four percent off the top, that's all. That's that's their profit. Yeah, it absolutely is, and he's right. And you know, he's got such a 
a balanced, even keel approach to this. So when you hear predictions that sound really, you know, kind of not even keel, I'd listen to him. I take him more seriously than somebody like John McAfee, who joked about, you know, Bitcoin hitting a million dollars or he'd eat his dick. Uh, but I had to jump in there. I said, so, uh, so Tim, if, if your prediction is wrong, are you going to, and I, I'm on the spot thinking, what could I, you know, challenge him to eat? And I came up with a raw egg and, and he laughed and he said, yes, he would eat a raw egg if the prediction didn't happen. So. Right. Not really a big deal because, you know, I saw Rocky drink a whole glass of raw eggs and, you know, Sylvester Stallone actually did that. So uh, Tim Draper could probably have one, but I hope he doesn't have to. Yeah, but if he does, I hope he live streams it. <laughs> that would be great. Hey, also uh, during our show, we had uh, a friend of the show, Vesa, uh, Vesa Kivenen. He is a crypto artist and uh, he is very talented. He, he was with us on episode uh, badco.in forward slash 130. And he commemorated that, that, that by creating an art piece. And this art piece has been signed over time by pretty much every crypto luminary in the world, even more so than, than, than people who are on virtual blockchain week. I mean, he's got all these other people who have signed it. Pretty, pretty amazing piece. Mm -hmm. And so he's all about art for crypto. And uh, and and uh, and doing really good stuff, and he had a really a really amazing talk, Mr. Joko. Yeah, he believes that crypto art, as unique limited edition assets, have the opportunity to also go ten x, hundred x, and a thousand x. He believes that you know, as an investment, there's a ton of potential in these unique you know pieces of crypto art. So um, check out his stuff, artforcrypto.com. He's got a lot of the images of his mm -hmm. work there. And he's got a lot of prints. So if you don't want to pay for the, for the one, that's, that's maybe one Bitcoin. So that's kind of expensive for some people. But he's got a lot of prints of some of these really cool pieces as well. So you know what? Support those that are trying to help you know, bring uh, crypto mainstream adoption to the masses and you know art he's doing all he creates all this really cool art man a lot of a lot of, it's a lot of different mediums he'll pull in some paint pull in some some physical things and create these really cool pieces overall very nice stuff he's very talented and remember if you can't be an athlete then be an athletic supporter that's true because there's that and, and you know there was definitely a theme the whole week a lot of talk around coronavirus a lot of talk around quantitative easing a lot of talk about the having and uh, charlie shrem you know didn't disappoint in our chat with him he basically said that due to quantitative easing and the having that we should expect to see uh, a major bull run at some point he's not saying it's going to happen this week He's just saying it makes sense that by 2021, we should really see. And he he referenced the, the data from the last halving and said that, you know, if you'll look at the charts, the bull run didn't happen leading up to the halving. It happened after it. Yep, it certainly did. And he also said this, the stock market, I don't have faith in it. It's very manipulatable. I don't know any stocks. I don't own any stocks for that reason. So you're telling me that half the country doesn't have a job, but the stock market is making all-time highs? Like, how is that even, how does it even correlate to how our economy is actually doing? And that was in reference to a question that we had that said that in April it was one of the biggest uh, gaining months, in, I think the biggest gaining month of all time in the stock market, S&P 500 or whatever, just the whole, the whole thing. And uh, I think that's because, we saw the all-time high hit 30-something thousand, and then it dropped down. But then the gains that we had in April were a pretty big gain. But but all these, like a third of the people were without jobs. And that, it's just, it's just so weird that you can see that things are still being propped up and people are very hopeful. But, I mean, who knows? Like, you could just, something bad could happen and the bottom could just drop out. It it could. You don't know. I mean, there's uh, so much uncertainty out there. And I think just realizing that things are going to change. Things are always changing. It's the one thing you can be certain of is that things will change. And Ch -ch -ch changes. All right. Adding some David Bowie to the Bad Crypto Spotify playlist. Time can't change. I can't change time. Certainly one of the most interesting segments of entire virtual blockchain week was when we welcomed John McAfee 
to uh, to the stage for a chat. We even got to bring Janice, his wife, on towards the end of it and uh, started on a little awkward, but it really ended on a bang. And by that, I mean, I asked John if he had any of his guns around. He turns around <laughs> and he whips out an AK-47. Yeah. Uh, and there's a great picture of it. We got picked up by Zero Hedge, Travis. You spotted that this morning. Yeah, it was so funny. It was Please, people, when do you know John McAfee to not have a gun nearby? <laughs> it was I the clip on that thing. It, it, he just pops it out right behind him. He's like, here it is. Like, yeah, John McAfee's always prepared. And here's what he said. He goes, go buy guns first. <laughs> because, uh, if you, because if you don't have food, if you have guns, you can take other people's food. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we're living in a paradigm the world has never seen before. Please, people. <laughs> he's 74 now, and he said one third of the planet is in lockdown, adding that most of these people are sitting at home watching TV, not doing much of anything, while the U.S. government, quote, pulls money out of thin air, and the situation is not sustainable. And he said money is based on something called industry, production, service. We haven't increased any of that, he said with a deep, unsettling chuckle. <laughs> he does have a deep, unsettling chuckle. He, he does, but he was also saying that it's too late for crypto. He's like, it's like people are not just going to go jump into crypto right now because it's not easy enough to use. It's not like opening a bank account. You have to spend days understanding what it is and how it is. And I think he has a point there but I think more and more people are, are trying to understand because guess what? They got plenty of days to be spending understanding things. They're, they're stuck at home, people. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, McAfee is going to McAfee, right? He's going to say what he's going to say. I, I disagree. Um, I think especially with having, you know, more Bitcoin ATMs out there and apps that make onboarding into crypto seamless and transparent. I think it's going to, you know, that is, we've always said that that's the key. It's not, it, mass adoption isn't going to happen when people all of a sudden get an education on how to use a Trezor wallet or how to move from one exchange to another or open up a, you know, uh, a MetaMask. That stuff is complicated and most people aren't going to take the time. But if you've got, you know, something easy, Easy. You know, we've talked about crypto.com in the past and it's, you got it. You have a debit card. It's easy. You fund the damn thing. You can buy crypto with it. You can buy groceries with it, whatever. And you know, we talk about it when we talk about Moby pay onboarding people with a mobile phone number. There mm -hmm. are methods that are going to lead to adoption that don't include the types of things he's referencing. That's very true. And I just got to say, how crazy is that, that we put on a virtual conference and people like Zero Hedge picked up an, uh, picked up an article from the con that just blows. That just blew me away when I saw that. I was like, wait a second. What? Oh, that. Oh, it is. That we're mentioning that. That's just so crazy. So the content that uh, that came out of this thing was was is newsworthy. That, that's that's exciting to me. Well, yeah, cool. these people, you know, these are the people that we wanted to present to the world and they had stuff to say. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, towards the end, when he pulled out the AK 47, he, uh, he looked at the rifle and he said, this sucker will always fire. <laughs> yeah. By the way, the coin telegraph interviewed him after, and he, after his talk, and there's an article on Cointelegraph, by the way, all the links to all these articles are in the show notes. Go to badco.in forward slash 402 to see. Uh, we've covered before that John says he is 99% certain that he knows who Satoshi Nakamoto is, but he's not going to out him. Well, I would also say this, John McAfee is also known you know, to, to, to sort of, uh, he, he sort of reminds me of a hype man, sort of like, you know, the old circus guys. Like he's like, he likes to build, that's why he did that whole, I'm going to eat my dick. If it doesn't hit a million dollars, he's sort of PT Barnum in a way. He's like the PT Barnum of crypto. And so I think that he says, I know 99% who Satoshi is. And then people are going to go, Oh, John McAfee knows who Satoshi is. Oh, but I'm not going to tell you. Okay, that's just some P.T. Barnum well, part of his personality. The reason he's saying he's not going to tell anybody is because if he was right, then Satoshi's going to have to hire 50 security guards and change his life or else he'll die. Um, and he's questioning, you know, do I want to destroy? What if I'm wrong? 
then I'll destroy an innocent man's life forever and probably mm-hmm. cause his death. So he said, quote, at that moment, I understand I won't say no more and your name will never leave my lips. And, and that's why I never continued past Craig Wright because the name would have, would have to leave my lips. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Very nice. Classic McAfee, right? Mm-hmm. Now, Mr. Joe Com. so on, uh, what was his day? Was it Thursday? Maybe I think it was Friday. I'm not sure exactly what it was. I think it was Friday. It would have been Thursday. Yeah, Justin okay. was closing on Thursday. Okay, so closing us down on Thursday night was the one and only Justin Sun. Do, 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 do. And uh, it was it was interesting because Joel and I, we were we were giving him some some questions to see how he would answer them because there's some tough stuff going on out there. There's some people who are not happy with Justin Sun, how he handled the steam hive thing, all the stuff that's sort of going on with that. So yeah, we did not have we we were told he was going to give a presentation. That is true. We were told he was going to give us a presentation. And then at the last minute, he says, what? Uh, this is a fireside chat. And so we're like, OK, well, <laughs> get ready for some fire. <laughs> right. Here comes, uh, we didn't expect it. We just I think everybody had this deer in the headlights look like, uh, you know, because I would be like, all right, Justin, we understand, you know, your people have told us that you've got some slides and a presentation because that's they wanted to script you know, what he was going to say. And he looked at us like, no, there's no presentation. At which point I, I think his team was probably going like, what? You know, I had this moment like uh, where they say, okay, nobody panic. And everybody just goes, ah, and they run around like chicken. Oh, yeah. Said, we ask him about steam, that whole process and how he got all these exchanges to sort of take their user steam that was stored on their exchanges and use that for the voting power to then allow him to, to utilize and uh, he, he says it was we don't like the word acquisition of steam we like to talk about it more of a partnership but it was the way they did it was sort of an acquisition the way they used their power to gain power of the network so it was wild which then upset the people and they forked it off and created hive which is a new network and interesting very much worth watching the interview. This one has been uploaded to our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash bad crypto. So check out what, what Justin had to say. It was definitely an opportunity for us to ask him anything. And we didn't. We didn't pull punches. And he was very accommodating, uh, very open to sharing, you know, what he wanted to share. He didn't put off any of the questions and say, I, you know, I don't want to or I can't talk about that. He answered, there was a couple of times when he was squirming when I asked him that question about, uh, you know, did China make him cancel that meeting with Warren Buffett? And oh, then yeah. I asked him another piece. And then, and then he didn't answer that part. And then you came in and said, no, no, the first part of that question is, did China make you do And he was, I mean, he's got, he was getting up out of his seat and he was moving all around. We, we held all like, to the fireside chat for sure. <laughs> yeah. And eventually he decided to put on a virtual background, which was kind of fun. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, we ask him a lot of great questions. So if you guys haven't listened to that one, you're going to want to tune into that one. That might be one that we want to just put up as a as a bad crypto well, episode. Uh, in, in fact, I think, you know, for those of you that missed the conference, or you're not going to go see the replays. Some of the content was so good that, you know, it may as well have been a bad crypto interview. So we will play that Justin Sun interview and probably Tim Draper and a, a couple others here over the course of the next, you know, four to six weeks. Now, here's one that we won't put on the show because it was a presentation and it relied heavily on visuals. You know, when we asked Don Tapscott to be the closing keynote, we knew he would come and and deliver the goods. What we didn't realize is the depth uh, that he would bring to a presentation. It was supposed to be 30 minutes and he had a 50 minute original presentation complete with slides stories analysis from the blockchain research institute titled the blockchain state of the union 2020 and again this is the type of presentation that he would get paid you know 100 and what is 130 thousand dollars to keynote yeah state so, yeah i would say that this video uh, presentation this should be one of those ones that get hundreds of thousands of views uh, because it was as good of any presentation I've ever seen. And it, and it ties in with what's going on now, ties in with what's going on in the world, where the world is headed. So many, di- like, it's one of those presentations where I almost need to watch it again and again, because it was so full 
there was, it, it, there's a lot to, there's a lot to unpack on his presentation yeah he, i actually prioritized getting this video up on our youtube channel it's there now if you'll go to the most recent videos you'll see the blockchain state of the union don tapscott he speaks a lot about the double spend problem being you know one of the biggest problem he talks about blockchain being the innovation in biggest innovation in human history and he talks about the various challenges that there are to widespread adoption there's like i don't know he i think he did like 56 slides in this mm. And it felt like this was all current relevant content. So rather than try to pick it apart here, we're just going to encourage you, go watch us. Just like the TED Talk he gave was must-see blockchain TV. For anybody interested in crypto, the Blockchain State of the Union is must-see. In fact, I'll just drop a direct link in the show notes so you guys don't even have to go and search for it to uh, to go watch this video first chance you get. Yeah. Not too hard, though, to find it. Just go to YouTube and type in bad crypto and then you can find our channel. Then all that stuff is there. But, man, I tell you what, that was that was completely fascinating. And what was really cool about it was he was in a loose mood. You know, it's like I think that he had had had, had, had a couple drinks, uh, some wine or something. He was relaxed and it was just a very, very good presentation. And then he ended up going into he ended up going into our after party and hanging out for a while, which was awesome. Did he did he rap with Crazy Bone? He did not. He did not rap with Crazy Bone. <laughs> the crazy Don. Hmm. <laughs> and also, so many great presentations. If you haven't had a chance to watch Chris Snook's presentation, that's one. He's my co-author with Digital Sense. That's one that you're going to want to unpack as well. And he did a really cool, the way he did it a really cool way, he actually switched his Zoom background behind him as the slide. So very unique. And he went in to some really interesting economic things and different uh, you know, sort of trigger points that are going on right now that uh, everyone should be aware of. Very well researched. He packed in a ton of information in that pot in that one as well. So many great presentations. I can't even. I just. I just can't even. Can't you can't even. even. Yeah. Go to virtualblockchainweek.com and make sure if you haven't checked out all the sponsor offer. There's some unique offers there. Some of them are going. You know, already over because the conference is over. But there's some there that are you know continue on in terms of getting some free tokens. Um, if you click the watch button or the watch live button, it will take you to the archives for all five nights. You can see the full agenda, um, the profiles and pictures of all the speakers that were there, as well as some of the things that were said on social. And uh, we might have to do this again, Mr. Travis Wright, with a lot more time for preparation next time around. Yeah, when we decided to do it in 30 days, we're, for one, we wanted to beat the having, right? Because that's going on. That's big news. And then, you know, we didn't know what Coindesk was going to do with Coin, Sen uh, Coin Census. <laughs> uh, and so I was like, oh, you know what? If we're going to do it, you really can't do it after Coindesk because that's 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 going to be like a whimper. But if we can do it before, we're like, yeah, maybe we can do it before 30 days. Really? We're going to launch this in 30 days. And we did it. And great job, Mr. Joel Com. Great job, Aaron Sell, our producer. Great job, uh, Team Bad Crypto, Chris Pulley, Ryan Loicano, Devin Price, everyone else who helped participate on the website stuff and keeping us all moving along. Thank you to each and every one of them. We could not have done it without you. We could not have survived without you. <laughs> in fact, we are going to take most of the rest of this week off. Uh, just to take a break, usually there would be a Tuesday show. There's not going to be a Tuesday show this week. We'll be back Friday evening at the regular time for our bad news episode of the week to give you the latest. We appreciate all y'all. Welcome especially to our new listeners and subscribers that are now here as a result of Virtual Blockchain Week. You are honorary citizens of the Republic of Bad Cryptopia. And while you're here, hopefully you will learn how to stay bad. Who's bad? The Bad Crypto Podcast is a production of Bad Crypto LLC. The content of the show, the videos, and the website is provided for educational, informational, and entertainment purposes only. It's not intended to be and does not constitute financial, investment, or trading advice of any kind. You shouldn't make any decisions as to finances, investing, trading, or anything else based on this information without undertaking independent due diligence and consultation with a professional financial advisor. Please understand that the trading of Bitcoin's and alternative cryptocurrencies have potential risks involved. Anyone wishing to invest in any of the currencies or tokens mentioned on this podcast should first seek their own independent professional financial advisor.